before we start streaming the service, while we still have this minute, the young ladies are handing out the April finance report. So everyone will be up to date with our church finances during this month, these two months we've been pretty much shut down. That'll get you caught up to where we're at. So for all the adults, before we start streaming, that what the girls are handing out is the, is the finance report. We want to keep everyone up to date what's been happening. Good morning. Welcome to the services at Kegley Baptist Church this morning. We're just beginning the live stream again this morning, and uh, we're going to be starting our service off a little bit different this morning with a very, very special uh, in music. I heard that uh, Brother Bill was uh, once chosen to be in a Christmas play nearly over 50 years ago, and he had to play a wise man, and he came out on the stage and forgot his lines. And went just when they wouldn't come to him, he just left. So after nearly 50 years, he's get a chance to redeem himself and come again and uh, open our service with a special music. Brother Bill Ease, come join us. Wanted to get a haircut uh, before I made my big debut, but uh, they were busy for the next two and a half weeks, so I guess I have to wait another week before that happens. And uh, with the social distancing and all, I, I can't do any autographs after church, so <laughs> I'll try to see what I could do here.
Oh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Bet you like the sound of that, don't you? Well, if you need your hymn book, you can turn to hymn number 15. Brethren, we've met to worship. We're going to stay seated. And let's enjoy singing this song. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word all is vain unless the spirit of the holy one comes down brethren pray in holy manna will be showered all around brethren see poor sinners round you slumbering on the brink of woe Death is coming, hell is moving, can you bear to let them go? See our fathers and our mothers and our children sinking down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Sisters, will you join and help us? As a sister aided him. Will you help the trembling mourners who are struggling hard with sin? Tell them all about the Savior. Tell them that he will be found. Sisters, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. Then he'll call us home to heaven. At his table we'll sit down. Christ will gird himself and serve us with sweet manna all around. Amen. Amen. Once again, it's good to see everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome those out there that's streaming us in. I'd like to invite you to the Kegley Baptist Church. I want to read you a verse, and then since I've invited people to come to the church, I want to tell you, take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about the church and the people, you and I and others, all right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, it says, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you've been called to be saints, which we have been, You've also been called to the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our Sunday school class, we've been uh, studying uh, the fellowship uh, last few uh, <laughs> Sunday school meetings we've had. All right, here at the Kegley Baptist Church, we are of the fellowship of Jesus Christ our Lord. The die has been cast we have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. We are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We won't look back. We've got our hands on the plow. 
We won't let up. We won't slow down. We won't back away. We won't be still. Our past is redeemed. Our present makes sense. Our future is secure. We're anchored within the veil. We are finished and done with low living, sight walking, for faith is the substance of things not seen. Uh, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, the fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, chintzy giving, and dwarf goals. With, all, with God, all things are impossible. Or are possible, not impossible, are possible. Here at the Kegley Baptist Church, we no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. We now live by presence, lean by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. Our pace is set, our gate is fast, our goal is heaven, our road is narrow, our way is rough, our companions few, our mission clear, our guide is reliable, and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's a little bit about us here, but I want to take just a minute and worry the pastor. <laughs> Talk about him for just a moment. Our pastor, Rick Setzer, cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, diluted, or delayed. He does not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. He preaches the dynamic, living word of God. Amen. And keep it up, preacher. We here at Kegley Baptist are of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. We must go until heaven returns, give until we drop, preach until all know, work until he comes, and when he comes to get his own, I'm going to get a little bit more personal here now, and when he comes to get his own, you know he calls his own sheep by name? Does you know he knows every one of you by name? And one day he's going to call you by name. Now I can come through the door back there and introduce myself to you and you can introduce yourself to me. And I'll guarantee before I get done talking to you, I forgot your name. But not our Savior. He'll call us one day by name because he knows us. He will have no problem. Amen. No problem recognizing us. And our colors will be clear. We are the sons of God and of the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So when he comes, he'll, <laughs> he'll recognize us. He knows our name. And I, I was going to, I don't want to get out of the sight here, but <laughs> I'm going to pick on my brother Gary over here for just a moment. He knows our name, but if he happens to forget our name, he will still be able to pick us out. I'll use Gary for an example. He'll look at him and he'll say, you're peculiar. You must be mine. That's what Peter says. We are a peculiar people. All right. 
As Forrest Gump said, that's about all I got to say about that. But you folks out there that are streaming in, now you know a little bit about us, you know a little bit about the church, you know a little bit about our pastor. And again, we like to invite you to come be with us. We're going to have prayer now. If you will all bow, we'll ask the Lord's blessing then. Our Father, as we come to you this time, Lord, we want to ask for your people, our brothers and sisters. Father, we've got some that are sick, down, can't get about, and we've got some that's just burdensome. Some are shut in, Lord, can't get about and get out. We'd ask that you'd be with them. Give them comfort, Lord. Help them through the day. And, Lord, out here in this world, we've got many that's lost. So many don't know the way, don't know the truth, and don't have life. If you have not Jesus, you have not life. We ask for them, Lord. And we ask for our country, the USA. We'd ask that you'd help us to overcome all the troubles and trials and tribulations that we're going through at this time, Father. And we'd thank thee for that. And then for a pastor, Lord, once again, fill him with thy spirit, Lord. Fill the message with the spirit, for we know it's not by might nor by power, but by thy spirit, Lord. So your blessings now upon him and upon the services to follow. And we're going to praise you and give you all the honor and the glory for what all is accomplished this year at the Kegley Baptist Church. Amen. Come the fount, hymn number 17, if you need a book. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger Interposed his precious blood Oh, to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn over to Luke chapter 17, while the scripture reading, then um, I believe we'll have a special music from Brother Mark and come to the message this morning. Glad to have you here with us. Folks that uh, was, were still streaming the service along, we move it quite along. And um, until we restart the Sunday school classes, the first Sunday of June is our, our plans and intentions. The church services are open. Uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night at 6 o'clock, Wednesday night at 7 if you'd like to come and be part of the live service in the auditorium. We'll continue to stream the services from here on out. But if you'd like to come just for the services, you're more than welcome to. The church is open. And as more and more things open up, uh, I, I feel burdened in my heart is more and more important now for the church to be going full steam ahead. So until the Sunday school, I appreciate Brother James Ford starting our service off. I know how much the Sunday school class uh, loves that man. So he's helping us out in the service here. And folks that have been helping us special music, I do sincerely appreciate it. We don't take time for all... Uh, for the offering giving, it's on the communion table. For those who give electronically, it's still available, whether on the, uh, through the website or here at the church. But uh, I believe that would be sufficient. Our camp dates were moved for the young people from, all, uh, from here to 1st of June. They will be July 27th through August 1st. To the young folks who are watching in, make sure you take note of that. We're going to have to get on contact with everyone to make sure we get everyone that's still going to be able to 
go to the Wilds Christian Youth Camp with us, July 27th through August 1st. We're going to be reading in Luke chapter 17. We're going to read verses 22 through 37. A little bit longer reading than I usually do. But if you'll follow along, uh, we'll come back to it in just a few minutes. So mark, mark that pages so we can come back to it. Luke 17 and um, verse 22. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be, or be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away, and he that is in the field, let him not likewise return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. We'll come back to this passage in just a few moments. I have several titles for it. Last Sunday night, we had some technical difficulties, and it was Mother's Day evening, and the evening service did, did, did not get streamed or did, did get not uh, put out on the YouTube or Facebook, or any other way, and um, I continued with the Sunday morning message from, from Mother's Day, and uh, since it was not seen by most of the church, I came back and thought I'd give most of last Sunday night's message over with a few additional uh, thoughts and uh, scriptures and passages that I was not able to get to. So I'm re-entitled, Attached to Sodom, Attached to Sodom, or... A uh, title you'll see as we get towards the end that I like, Let's All Stay Together. Let's All Stay Together. So we'll use those titles. Remember Lot's wife, attached to Sodom, let's all stay together. And ask the Lord's blessings this morning for all the nice folks that come to be with us today. And if you're watching with us at home or later on YouTube, thank you for joining in. Let's pray together. Holy Fathers, we come to you in prayer again and again. Hallowed be thy name, we've said this morning. And we pray that your kingdom would come. Help us to be desirous to see the kingdom. Dear Father, may our spirits be in tune with the word this morning. May we learn from it, be the better for it, and our hearts even geared more towards home and staying together for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor 
contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. That charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. And at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe I owe all to you, Jesus. See from his head, his hair, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did there such love and sorrow be? Or thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, my all. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I will all to you. I will all to you. Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. the song immediately then I heard the clarity of the of the guitar and I had to look up right away to see what guitar he was playing uh, that was really beautiful Mark That's, I appreciate the song well if you're here last Sunday morning for Mother's Day we had a little quiz right now what was the title of the message well somebody be able at home you could maybe say I remember I remember but I can't see your hand so I'll just have to go from here it was entitled mom started it and I was speaking of the exemplary faith of the women of the scriptures that uh, gave us the foundation of the church we have today. The exemplary faith of the women in the scriptures that laid the foundation of the church we have today. So I wanted to go back to part two on Sunday evening, kind of an opposite of that, uh, not so much as in the positive sense, but that we can get a positive from it. Remember Lot's wife. Well, it's hard to remember things, isn't it? Sometimes if you ask me what was last Sunday's, or give me two Sunday's messages ago, give me the title. We try and make it as plain and simple as we can, but it is hard to remember. Brother Ford said, if you tell us our name in a greeting, we'll walk away and we'll not remember your name. You've got to pay attention, don't you? And you've got to use it and, and reuse it and then rethink about it later if you want to retain it. I used it as a way of illustration how it becomes a motivation to remember certain things for a principle or for a purpose. Principle or a purpose. Remember the Alamo. Well, in 1836, very few of us, in March of 1836, very few of us remember the Alamo. Santa Ana, with nearly a little over 3,000 Mexican troops, surrounded that Spanish mission in San Antonio, and Travis Smith uh, with, uh, what, 
uh, about 180 uh, men to guard the mission for the purpose of the independence of Texas. Uh, well, I know this, see, who else was there? Jim Bowie, famous for his elongated knife, so the Bowie knife. Davy Crockett, Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Davy Crockett perished at Alamo. Davy Crockett actually was a senator from Tennessee, but he'd heard about the fight for independence of Texas and rounded up some volunteers to go and fight for the independence. And the Tennessee volunteers died at the Alamo. Who would remember those things unless you, you repeat it in a history lesson, right? And you go back and see it a little bit. There were a few survivors, but all the combatants of the Alamo perished. And it was just a few months after that, the Sam Houston rallied to, the troops again of Texas and others and uh, defeated Santa Ana with the theme, Remember the Alamo. Isn't it something in this passage we had this morning of all that's said in that passage? And there are some grand subjects in that passage. Those verses we read have a lot of Bible doctrine, even prophecy in it. But right there with the three short words, Remember Lot's wife. What's so important about that? Why is that just stuck and interject right in the middle of the passage which we just read? Let's go back to verse number 22, Luke 17, verse 22. There'll be a desire to, for folks to see one of the days, plural, of the Son of Man. The Son of Man was the title Daniel gave to the Messiah. It predominantly started there. And by the way, Lord willing, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going from the book of Daniel and speak about the gravity of our faith. And since you used the gravity for that, Lord willing, next Sunday morning we'll speak about the seriousness. Well, actually, I'm going to be going to entitle the message, Are You Serious in These Last Days? So two, two books, two times in a row, we'll come back to that. To see one of the days of the Son of Man, as Daniel spoke about. Here are some days here where people saw his earthly ministry, and some were believers. And they thought that he was he that should redeem Israel. So they had faith that he was the Messiah. And every day they desired to see that son of man. That, but he ascended and went back into heaven. There is going to be a day of the son of man come again someday. Do we desire to see it? This is actually part of the foundation of this message. Remember Lot's wife. Do you desire to see one of the days or the day of the son of man? Uh, so we continue on. Let's see verse number 24. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. When that day comes, it won't be mysterious then. You won't say he's hidden away or tucked away in Bethlehem or a little place of Judea, Galilee. He won't say, no, you know, he's off in some desert region, you know, and uh, of some continent and you've got to fl fly to see there. No. Revelation says, the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ said, Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And there is some allusion to it already in this verse as lightning is, that begins to streak over here in this western part of the sky and streams across to the eastern part of the sky. People over here, people over there are going to see it when the Son of Man comes. When we saw this passage where he said that there'll be some that will be in the bed and one be taken, one we take away, we realize that's someone who's at rest or sleeping. When there's two women grinding at the mill, we're realizing this is in the morning hours. When we see when we come down here, one will be in the field, one will be taken. We're in the work hours in the middle of a day. We realize there's an idea of a time zone taking place there. There's an idea of different people, different in increments of places. When you want to see the day of the Son of Man, it will be seen. When Jesus comes again. Uh, we'll continue on with that passage. Look at verse 25. But first he must be rejected of this generation. The folks that are hearing him speaking there. Um, will turn him away. He'll be crucified. So that's so simple in that part of the passage. But there's a comparison of the days. That day when the son of man comes. When it says likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. Well, I should say, uh, verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah. The, the comparative tense of messages several weeks back. The days of Noah, they ate, they drank, they gave, married and gave in marriage. Until, until what? The day that Noah was shut in the ark. 
It was life as usual. It was life in its sinful ways. Genesis tells us that every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. They continued on their sinful ways. No indication, no, no desire to repent of their wickedness. No desire to get in the only means of salvation, the ark. Until. Till the door was shut on the ark and the rain began to fall. Then it says, likewise also it was in the days of Lot. Comparative terms. Days of the Son of Man to Noah's day. Days of the Son of Man to Lot's day or in the region of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now a little bit more said about Lot. It says here, they did eat, same as Noah's day. They did drink, they drank, they bought, they sold. Commerce, the economy, continued as usual. They planted, they put their crops in the ground, and they built it. They started their building projects. What you see this on this passage, it says is, but the same day, everything they ate, everything they drank, every, every building project they started, everything they put in the ground, they continued to do it, just as it said, no, until. And the same day that the righteous wrath of God was revealed in Noah's day, and the same day the righteous wrath of God was revealed in the days of Lot, all that ended. It stopped then. It's not life as usual. And if I said, if I mentioned it last Sunday night, I mentioned again, life as they would say, boy, I wish things would go back to normal. From that day on, they are never going back to normal. When the day of the Son of Man comes, normal's over. Where were they taken? We see in this passage, when we come over here, um, the question, when we saw that these parallels are used, let's see if we can read in verse 34. I tell you, <clears throat> in that night, there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Verse 35, two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. That's the second use of the word taken. Here's the third. Two men shall be in the field. <coughs> Excuse me. The one shall be taken, <clears throat> and the other left. <clears throat> You know the natural question in this passage is actually asked here? Look at verse 37. And they answered and said, Where, Lord? Where were they taken? Now, I can see in the likeness, in the wording of this passage, as some would think, well, these, this one out of two in all these three instances, or one out of two in all these three time zones, or where folks would see the day of the Lord, <clears throat> were taken in the rapture. I do believe that is a distinct Bible teaching and is distinctly given to the church to understand the mystery of the body of Christ, the church, and how that time frame of the church ends with the rapture. And that I'm sure that in the day that the rapture takes place, the true body of Christ, the true church, people who have been born again, not professors, genuine possessors, We'll go on to part two of eternal security beginning this, this Wednesday night. For those who saw the foundation that God cannot lie in Hebrews, th four impossibilities of Hebrews, we're on Wednesday nights. The first one, God cannot lie what he's promised about. But there's a lot of folks and a lot of folks who say they're Christian. Everyone considers the West, Western civilization as Christian. And you know as well as I know, most of Western civilization is anything but Christian. But they think of us as the Christian West. They wonder why most of the Mideast and the Arabic countries, the Muslim countries, don't truly understand what true Christianity is, is because they've never seen it. What they recognize of the Christian West is our movies and our entertainment community and our di diplomacy that is, they've seen enacted through all these years, which is anything but truthful most of the time and with anything but moral most of the time, and they think that's Christian. So I come say this. There'll be some when the rapture takes place and the true, born-again, Bible-believing saints of God are called out and caught up together meeting Mary. Completely different than the second coming when he comes and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. you got to see there's a difference. And when some are caught up, yes, there will be some that may be walking along together and where'd he go? There could be some sleeping and one wake up and thinks, boy, something's different. Look over the part and said, where'd she go? 
There could be some that are at work, and we've always seen, heard these parallels. There could be folks on a certain airplane. There could be certain people driving down the car, and all of a sudden, a car over here goes off the ditch, and a car over there goes off the ditch, a car up there goes off the ditch. What's happening? Some were taken. So I can see the likeness to the rapture. And I think how that would scare people. Think of people going in the store, going shopping, you know, a saved man or a saved wife and a, a lost husband. They go into Walmart and go shopping, and he, he starts to look at a few things in the auto department, and he goes, well, I guess I better catch up with the missus. So he walks down one aisle, can't find a missus, goes to another aisle, can't find a missus. Goes down the third aisle, can't find a missus. So he gets on the phone and says, missus, where are you? And no answer. Well, that's usually how he finds her. So that from that day on, never see again. So I would think that the rapture church, to those who've never been saved, should be a fearsome and awesome thing. We'll come to that a little bit on one of these Wednesday nights here soon. But this, is, this passage in particular, and with Jesus answered, is not the rapture. And the taken three times is not be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. Bible context, Bible passage. Verse number three, where, Lord? Now, the Lord gives a very distinction. When he says, wheresoever the body is, and by folks, this could use, be used the word here, translated carcass. Wherever there's a dead animal, there's a buzzard. You want to know where something's died in the field? You want to go on the farm, you want to go on the farm and, and, and see the buzzard circling over a pasture land over there? You know what you're going to find? You're going to find a dead calf, groundhog, possum, or something. Wherever the body is, there were the eagles... The birds that carry them be gathered. This in particular in Revelation, the book of Revelation, the unveiling of the Lord. Revelation 16, 17, 18, 19 finally deals with the second coming of Christ. Chapter 19, behold, a great white horse. And by the word of his mouth, he speaks. Worth that word of the mouth, he speaks. And the army, <coughs> the Armageddon, of all the lost who've gathered themselves against, together against God will perish. The blood will flow to the reins of the horse's mouth from one end of the Jordan Rift to the other. So much will be. How many people will that be? Maybe two million. Who knows? I've heard some folks say several million. Can you imagine an armed force gathered together against God at that time? Revelation 19, then let's go down to the end of the verse. I think it's verse 21. It says this, How will that day in that battle of Armageddon end? And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword pro proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The circling of all the birds of carrion will be over the valley of Armageddon to eat the flesh of everyone slain with the... That's the day of the Lord. That's the answer he's given here. Where you see the circling of the birds, you'll, you'll know there's the dead. That's where they were taken. And each of these passages, if I can go on and continue on with this, the thought of this a little bit. Uh, look back at verse number 31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. He's talking about that day of the Lord. There is a day, as in Noah's day, until, until the day of Sodom, or the day of Lot in Sodom, until, until what? The fire fell. So fierce was the judgment and so rapid was the, the judgment of God. There will be one here, one there. 50%, if you want to put it like that, will be taken away in death. Taken away in the wrath and judgment of God. That's what he's describing here. If someone's on the housetop, I mentioned this in the service. I almost stepped away like you did, Brother James. Get over here in April. Go, get back over there. I realized... Get back in the camera shot here. I realize what's taking place here. In the Old Testament, when it speaks about the folks who are responsible for their houses, you know what we talk about Judeo-Christian ethics. Why do you have on your house an insurance policy that, that covers accidents? If someone was to come and visit and maybe fall off your porch or someone was to come to visit and to, you know, come and clean a house and maybe stumble over a step, why do you have that kind of insurance on your house? You realize in the Old Testament, 
they were commanded to put battlements or railings upon the tops of their houses. Most of, the, most of those homes in those days, as you see the pictures of old, old Jerusalem, still similar today, kind of a flat, kind of a flat adobe type house with um, on top of it, there would either be stairwells on the outside going up to the roof or inside there'd be one encasement of a stairwell going up. Inside those simple homes, no more, usually about more than one great room or two at the most, there would be the kitchen area and, a, and then a sleeping area to be out of the elements. But the entertainment area, the relaxation area, the living room was on the roof. And to keep for their children from falling off. Let's use that as a message someday. Building, putting battlements on your house for your children. Putting railings. Why do you put railings around top stairs? Keep people from falling. Keep them safe. So I see when he's speaking about he that is on the rooftop. When that day comes, don't whether it's the staircase on the outside to go back down, go in the front door, or you were fortunate enough or a little wealthier enough to have a staircasing on the inside to go down. He's saying so rapid and so quick and so awful will the judgment of that day be. Don't go back down in the house. Jump over the battlement and head for the hills. We come along this, and he that is in the field, return not back again. So it is in the midday. You do find yourself out planting the crops. You do find yourself out, and maybe you're on the seashore getting ready to mend the nets to go out fishing. But you're in the workforce of the day, and you start seeing the fire fall, and you look back towards the city, and you realize, oh my goodness, what's happening? It's the day of the Lord. Don't go home. But I need my backpack. But I need to throw. The, I need to get a, some, a suitcase together and grab some things and throw. He says, "Go over the rooftop, head for the hills. Don't go back home. Remember Lot's wife." Now you have all the text. Con it's the great and awesome. Sometimes we say terrible. It's the great and awesome day of the Lord. It's his. It's his return to this earth. In fiery judgment. Huh? Remember Lot's wife. How about a refresher on that before we come to what's being said about this? Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19, verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters. Well, I better pause for a moment. I'm actually hearing Bible pages turn this morning. Let me just stand here and enjoy it for a minute. Go ahead and turn. Just turn somewhere. Oh, yeah. Rattle the page. If you don't have your Bible, get a hymn book, girls. Turn the hymn book. Fool, fool me with it. Okay, go ahead and get a hymn book, too. I don't want to pick on the girls. Or hold your phone up so I can see the glow on your face. Verse 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, when the angels hastened Lot, they had to hurry him up. They had to, they had to prod him. They had to say, get going now. Lot saying, arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters. He's not getting the married ones. He's getting the two heads still remaining at home. Which are, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. That is one place I pause that I can't do as much this morning. But it doesn't say to be consumed with the fire that's about to fall. It doesn't say being consumed with, you know, uh, the, the walls beginning to fall. Unless you be eaten up with the sin of this city. Yes, the judgment's coming for that sin, but something here, remember the title, attached to Sodom. We come back, he says, and while he lingered, as much as the angels of the Lord are prodding him and trying to hurry him up and telling how imminent the destruction is coming, he's still slow poking. He's still hanging behind. So the men, the angels in, the, in, in human form laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. 
They physically got a hold of his two daughters, his wife and Lot, and pulled them out of Sodom. Now, I'm not reading the in-between passages, lest thou be consumed. But Lot says, I, I don't know if I can live in the mountains, and Zoar's over there. Lot requests that he can live in Zoar. <coughs> He's granted that, he goes there, but obviously out of Zoar, when the judgment and the fire begins to fall, he realizes that Zoar's not even safe, and on his own now begins, <coughs> boy, if the angels had still had a hold of them, what's about to happen probably wouldn't have happened. But... <coughs> They begin to travel now to the mountains like they should have and were to go for the safety. They had one thing that they were supposed to remember. The angels had told them and said, if you'll look at it, um, I think it's uh, somewhere in verse number 17, in all the plain, escape to the mountain lest thou be consumed. I'm looking down the verses because I'm trying to jump for time where they commanded. And when you leave, do not look, do not look back. I come down to verse number 20. I think I'm in verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him. And she became a pillar of salt. Several things to explain here as we come to these practical points in the message. Real quickly. She lingered behind. My reference Bible here shows me that she lagged behind. Or is behind. The angel has not a hold of her hand anymore. They've been commanded in those in-between passages. As you'll, as you'll read it for the time. You'll read it to not look back. She's not only looking back, she's lagging behind. And she does, as it says, sets her face to go back. That's the wording. Sets her face to return. She's turned to a pillar of salt. I, I read a little story. Not that the seriousness almost makes me want not to use it, but it kind of get an idea how kids think. Where the preacher was preaching about this, where Lot's wife looked back, turned to a pillar of salt. And the little boy said, that's nothing. My mother looked back and turned into a telephone pole. So that's the way maybe a kids would think about it. I don't think she was like the, the emblem on the front of a Morton salt container with a little umbrella skippity doodle along. I do believe, as archaeologists believe, uh, believe and have found enough remnants of the cities of the plain or valleys of the plain of those cities, that in the Dead Sea region, with all its high contents of minerals, that that was the slime pits or the, the veil of, of, of pits and so like that, that there's enough mineralization there, they believe, that volcanic ash, action uh, buried and made all those mineral deposits, so like that. All that to say this, I believe when she turned and headed back, just as the Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii, Italy, uh, centuries and centuries ago erupted with, with such quickness that the people busy about their things in the city of Pompeii, they were buried or calcified, mummified, calcified as they were baking, as they were fleeing, mothers sheltering their children, people laughing and playing. They were buried instantly, calcified, and there they stood. I, or there they lay. I believe as Lot's wife lagged and got back, she was in, captured by the ashes of the judgment and fire of God, and she was mineralized in the deposits of the Dead Sea. And there she is. Remember Lot's wife? When the day of the Lord comes, does that give an idea? Did you see that mysterious passage that folks for, have made all kinds of supposition about that have been, he that seeketh to save his life shall lose it, and he that seeketh to lose his life shall save it? That's directly kind of, if you want to save your life in that day, you're going to have to lose everything that's behind the head for the hills. You'll save your life. But if you think you're going to go back in that city and save life, you'll lose it. So that begs the question, why did Mrs. Lot, why did Lot's wife, why are we told in those three simple words, in the day, great and day, terrible day of the Lord, remember Lot's wife, why did she lag behind? Why did she want to go back? It's simple. 
You still in Luke 17? Look at verse number 20. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. Look at verse number 31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house. Let's stop right there. Use the title attached to Sodom because it, Sodom starts with an S. Next three things in these few simple mi minutes we have left. That's where her stuff was. I'm at work. But boy, the, all the stuff, the fire of God and everything that's falling. I, I need my backpack. I need my sleeping bag. I need my tent. And I think it's more than that. I need a blanket. So if I'm going to survive in the mountains, I need my blankets. That's very simple. That's where all her stuff was. That's where all her possessions were. Isn't it any wonder that the Bible says in Colossians, you know, that we should um, not cover the things of the earth, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. My, Matthew chapter 6, we all know verse 33. We sing it so cutely in children's church, and it has such a nice melody. and has several other verses, and we just sing it so well. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his, let's all sing it together. Some sing hallelujah, some sing the verse. Oh, it's so pretty. Do you realize what it's saying? It is preceded with, with lay, don't, don't lay up for yourself treasures on this earth where moth and rust do cor doth corrupt. Years ago when most fine clothing was made of true materials and didn't have polyesters, didn't have treating, a lot of times our clothes are preserving our body more than we really realize. Even bugs won't eat what we wear today. But in olden days, you could put your wool coat in a cloth and a moth would eat it. You'd open up the closet and lo and behold, the bugs, different types of bugs, but in particular. So you got mothballs. If you ever smell them still today, you're probably thinking, that sure smells like great grandma's house. Why? Because you had to put them in your, your drawer. The bugs would eat it. You had to put them in your closet. The bugs would eat it. Eat your clothing. Don't lay up for yourself treasure where moth or rust doth corrupt. If you let it sit long enough, it'll decay on its own. The natural empty of the law, laws of nature. Natural empty. It'll decay on its own. I mentioned, and no one got to hear it, but I'll tell you, even with the church not being used for eight weeks, things fell apart. I mentioned we had to, we, the fan all of a sudden just came on the fellowship hall and our air conditioning system came on. I said, who turned that on? There's nobody been here. And we couldn't shut it off, so we had to get a technician here to fix the air conditioner over there. It just came on and wouldn't shut off. We've had to fix this unit over here, this middle floor. This, this one's the mystery of all mysteries. No one's been walking on this floor. Now, if you walk on it and you ever want to be quiet, it creaked from here to there. It didn't do that when we was using it. If you just let it set, it'll rust. Park a car in the field. Don't start it for a while. Put your tractor in a barn. Don't use it for a while. Let your house go. Go away for three months. Come back and say, well, that shingle's falling off. That spouting's coming down. Go inside and the cabinet door's hanging sideways. How did that all happen? That's the natural law of entropy. And I'm going to say this, don't set your treasures here where, where bugs can eat it or it will rust and decay. Set your treasure, Colossians said it this way, set your affections on things which are above. When the day of the Lord came, Miss Lot wanted to go back home because she, her priority was the stuff. That's number three, really. I'm kind of going in reverse order. If you're thinking ahead of me, you know, there's something more she's more attached to there than that. But that's one thing that's mentioned, the stuff. Let's look at the second thing. Well, I could say it. I would probably say back in, in Sodom was her society. Now, what do you mean? That was her normal culture. We read the passage, and I don't have time to go back through the passage in scriptures where Lot prospered when he was with Abraham. And Lot is already uh, just assumed in the passage since he pitched his tents towards, tents towards Sodom that he already has a family. He already has a livelihood. He couldn't live in prosperity. You know when it's a dangerous time for a church? When it's prosperous. Strife that comes upon. There was a strife between Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen. That's the time when you should get along best. 
but it usually isn't. That's another subject. Folks don't know what to do with the money. If you don't have it, who worries about it? And trust God by faith for more. You have more faith when you have it. So anyways, her society, they, they pitched their tent towards Sodom. Next thing we know, they dwell in Sodom. That's the actual verse, dwelling in Sodom. Next thing we know, Lot sits as a, in the gate of Sodom. That's the city, that's the, that's the uh, <clears throat> court of commerce. Somehow he's connected, maybe in his wealth, to the commerce of Sodom. In that, he might as well be a principal judge. You came to the judges like Absalom, David's son. You come to, to judge the people at the gate. He has a place of predominance uh, in the city of Sodom. And his wife is right there with him. Now, it's not said except this passage. Remember Lot's wife. Everything that she owned was, in that, was back there. And all the society she knew, the affections of her life were Sodom. That's her society. There are so folks attached to the club. That's their, that's their preeminent thing in their life, the club, the lodge. There's, there's the preeminent thing in their life, the lodge, the preeminent thing in their life, the, the, the league, the league, the league. That's the preeminent thing in their life. Well, they wouldn't want Jesus to come again because they play this Tuesday and they don't want to miss the ball game. They want Jesus to come because that's the society. We got kids, our kids, we got one of our daughters engaged. We got a wedding coming up. If Jesus would come, he'd mess that all up. I'm saying to the young folks, trying to remind myself, saying to you, the best thing that can happen today for you and I is for Jesus to come again. And everything we enjoy immensely down here is just going to be a peanut shell compared to what Jesus can bring us. Keep that in mind. Because some folks, if the Lord came this afternoon, it'd mess up all their plans for this week. Amen? Now, isn't that a bummer? I don't think that's, I think that's number two. I think number one is obvious. There's suffering going on in Sodom. Who's suffering? Her daughters and her son-in-laws. Not said here, but you could probably safely assume because of the age and time frame of the, the movement and the rescue from Abraham, they may even be grandchildren in Sodom. And hence the title with another S, Let's Stay Together. Because when, when Lot went to his son-in-laws and his daughters and said, this old wicked city is going to be judged by God, the angels have told me so, and there's been a miraculous confirmation of that, if you haven't heard about it. We've got to get out. He seemed as one that mocked. And Lot and his wife didn't want to leave the town. They had to be forcibly taken out of town why would they not want, maybe they thought that as long as they stayed near their daughters and near their son-in-laws, they could save them, and they couldn't. And when the fires were falling, and Mrs. Lot and Lot are heading up to the mountains now as they were supposed to be, and you hear the screams and shrieks of the, plain, of the cities of Zoar, Gomorrah, and Sodom, That's my kids. That's my grandkids. What can you say to that, Brother Rick? Here's what I can say to that. Live a life today that your children can trust your testimony. Amen? Why did Lot seem as one that mocked? Because he's dwelling and living amongst the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and ruling and, and has his commerce there. And when he says the judgment of God is falling for sin, they didn't believe him. That's the importance of living a life that your testimony, that your children believe that Jesus is, because you said it, Jesus is coming again, could be this Tuesday. And your kids will say, okay. Amen? 
And your kid said, Dad, if you think so, Papa, if you think so, if you believe that the Lord could come this year, this month, this week, if you believe that any time Jesus could come again, it's so. Why? Because you said so. Now, I'm going to throw this in here. I didn't share it last week, but I'm going to say this. Who do you really trust in this world that no matter what they told you, you'd believe them? I think there's got to be a lot bigger, higher priority put on a person's word and, and respect for it. That's why you have a quote about George Washington in your bulletin, by the way, this morning. And we'll use some of those things tonight. So read that quote Thomas Jefferson said about, uh, and the word, the big word for the day is consanguity. That's in that statement. That means relation by blood. Uh, George Washington showed no favoritism because just someone was of the same family as his. So anyways, person's word. Have you read some stories of people who said they were kidnapped by aliens in a swamp in Louisiana? Did you believe it? Nope. Did you hear that aliens have landed on a mountaintop in Peru and they really built those, those, those um, pyramids? Do you believe that? Nope. Who do you truly believe? Now, I'm going to say this. On Mother's Day, I wore Grandpa's coat. I believe my Grandpa Lichty told me. First of all, I didn't make up any of those super fabricated stories. But whatever my grandfather told me, I'd believe him. There's few people in life like that, isn't there? You may have one or two in your family. Thank the Lord for it. Now, listen to me. Can we live a life that when we tell our kids that the only way to be saved and born again is Jesus? And he's the son of God, and he's coming again, and it could be any time. Don't you want your kids to believe you? Then don't get too attached to the society and the stuff of this world. Amen? Number two on that one. Um, the priority of instructing your children in the scriptures. Amen? Kids don't know. They know nothing to have their, their authority to base their life on the authority of the scriptures. They don't know. They've heard enough of the devil putting asterisks about everything that have been taught. You don't really know if this is the word of God. You don't know that's the word of God. You don't know if this is the truth. And, you know, all versions are about the same. And there's errors here. And there. That, even what they did were taught, there's been asterisks put all over it by the devil. Yea, hath God said. They don't know what they believe. Paul was said to Timothy, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and being assured of uh, that the, the scriptures, from a, that from a child that has known the scriptures, make thee wise in the salvation. Timothy, you continue in what your grandma and your mama taught you. Aren't you glad his mom and grandma taught him? That's how the church continues. The priority of living a life that the kids believe what you say. The priority of instructing your children in the scriptures. So why'd you say staying all together? So Lot could have went to all his family and said, the judgment of God is coming. We need to get out of town. And they said, Papa, we're with you. Dad, we're coming. And Lot, Mrs. Lot, and all the daughters, married or unmarried, sons-in-laws and grandchildren, find themselves out of Sodom. Remember Lot's wife. Someday Jesus is coming again. If it's for the church and the rapture, praise the Lord. Some will be taken, some will be left behind. Woe unto those that are left behind. When he comes at the end of the seven-year tribulation period to establish his kingdom on this earth, it's going to be such a fearsome day, you better hope that you're in the mountains. And you better hope that your kids believe you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Holy Father, bless the service as we preach your word. May our hearts be taken off our attachment to this world. May our hearts be set on heaven. May your kingdom come. But Lord, should you tarry, may it be so we can still reach our families and our loved ones. Oh, Lord.
to be prepared. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. This time for reverence and respect for one another and for the Lord. You say, Brother Rick, I've never been born again. Briefly, I say, years ago, Miss Willa May said she just couldn't get saved, Brother Rick, because my daughter's lost. I don't want her to die and go to hell alone. I told Miss Willa May, well, then you get saved and you lead her to heaven with you. I'm thankful that that finally resonated on her to, set, to come to Jesus. Why don't you be born again and lead the way and lead your family to heaven? Brother Rick, I've never been saved, but I'd like to be. Anybody like that? I'll pray for you. No one's looking around. The crowd we have here this morning, everyone's praying. Brother Rick, pray for me. I need to be born again. Then as a continuation of Mother's Day, moms and dads alike, we live in an old Sodom-like world. Help me to lead my family to faith and belief. So when Jesus comes again, we go together. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together in closing the service. Just as I am. Several verses. We'll close the service. If you'd like to be saved, have someone show the scriptures, I'll meet you here. Steve is standing here in the front. Lead this. I'll put you in camera range here, partner. 249. Let's sing verse number one together. Just as I am. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come, and waiting not, verse 2 together, just as I am. Dark blood to thee, whose blood can cleanse each part of him. We're going to sing one other verse. It's going to be verse number five. Thou wilt receive. Verse five. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome pardon. Cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning, everyone that's here this morning. Six o'clock, the church doors will be open. A few minutes before that, come see one another. And... Uh, <clears throat> I know, I just, I was just, I say it, I know we live in perilous times, and those, there may be some folks more prone to illness than others. I understand that completely. But I know this, if I get on the highway, drive 60 miles an hour, looked it up this morning, Tammy asked what I was doing. I drive 60 miles an hour and drive 100 miles, you got it like a 3.8% chance of death. Hasn't kept me from getting on 460. I read that I've gone on a golf course and it's be above 85 degrees and the sun's shining that I have nearly, I have about a 5% chance of sunstroke if I don't wear a white hat. I have a greater chance of death at Emerald Island, North Carolina, getting caught in a riptide than I do of getting coronavirus. You have about a 1.2% chance, chance of getting it, just a normal stage of life. So I'm going to say, you're going to take your chances somewhere. Maybe you ought to consider the house of God. It's a safe place to be. Thanks for coming. Now I hope I didn't ruin your afternoon with that conclusion. <laughs> Amen. I'm just trying to be some common sense faith. Lord, bless the service. Tonight, 6 o'clock, hope to see you here. Lord bless you.